Welcome to Bond Park. I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And I'm Marshall Ward. Hey, and I'm Greg Haiku. Crushed it. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome, Welcome to, to Bond, Bond Park. Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Communications and Technology Waterloo Region is once again hosting events during the month of March in support of International Women's Day. Programming extends across sectors and includes some outstanding panels related to youth. Save the date. Their first event will be held in person on March 1st in the evening. For more details and information about the planning committee, event information, dates and times, follow WCT Waterloo Region on Facebook or LinkedIn. Hope to see you there. All right, Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And I'm always really intrigued by people who start their own businesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, You usually talk about it with like a sense of fear and like awe. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you don't, I don't know how you don't lay awake at night sometimes (laughs) just. (laughs) Or do you? Who said I don't? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's, I I have so much admiration because I always think it's such a big gamble, you Mm -hmm. know, to, uh. To start your own business and you're betting on yourself right mm-hmm. you're betting on yourself but greg's coming to it at i'm assuming you can tell us your own story you're coming to it with the education and the practical to be able to do this kind of stuff tell us what you do because you could be anything as far as any listeners listening right yeah, now. Hey, so maybe you're a burlesque dancer what do you do yeah <laughs> i am a physiotherapist by trade and a business owner by happenstance um came into it by accident you know kind of fell into it i didn't ask for it just was offered and Rolled with it from there. Um, my primary practice is orthopedic physiotherapy. Uh, we do that a lot through the week with many v- different patients across the region. And then in addition, I'm a partner in four rehabilitation clinics. And again, they all kind of came by themselves. Uh, Live Well is the name. It's it's beautiful in simplicity, right? But it really it does epitomize what it is like your vision, right? Yeah, you know, our original clinic was Absolute Rehab Center in Waterloo. And then my partner and I purchased Live Well Health and Wellness in Baden from Sarah Scott, who started it. Um, and as we grew, we wanted to become one brand. And we went with the Live Well because of that, you know, it just had a great fresh name to it and it represented what we do and what we want from our patients at the end of it. And it keeps the idea open for if you want to add services or takeaway or whatever that might look like. Absolutely. We're always looking for... You know, we just added a natural path to our one clinic. Um, it's a new service across all the clinics. It's, you know, sounds like I'm promoting here, but I'm just sharing No, you're news. here to promote. Yeah, right? you're no, here to promote. I'm not a promoter. <laughs> we just uh, do what we do. Uh, <laughs> Tell us what a day in the office looks like for you. Well, I'm an early guy, so I'm there at seven and I'm booked back to back with patients. Uh, and I work three very long days for sure with patients. And then in between, I do some business management stuff. Um, Thursdays are my day to hit the grindstone on business and meet with uh, staff, you know, incoming staff, make sure the business is running. And then Friday's kind of the see some patients and loose ends. Sarah and I worked on a film about the KW Bilingual School. It's a documentary. And one of the uh, one of the students towards the end of the film, they're, t- they're talking about what they want to be when they grow up. And the one says, I'd like to be a physiotherapist. She said, I, 
I'm just going to paraphrase, but she basically says, I find hospitals kind of scary, right, and stressful. Uh, so I like the idea of helping people in an environment that's um, not so much that, right? Um, do you remember your earliest um, ideas about possibly going into this field and, and your thoughts around what it was, you know, and, and, and what you could do? Yeah, I mean, I think I've always wanted to help people. Um, I didn't know much about being a physio. I kind of came again. Another thing that just happened organically, I needed to have a year to find myself after undergrad. So I moved out west and my mom pleaded with me to apply to grad school. And she was right. I would have not come back. So I got into physio school. I didn't know really what physio was at that point. Um, No one in my family was a physio. My mom was a nurse. Um, had retired quite early when she had three boys, luckily. Um, and how I became a physio, I don't know. I say it's a cliche, but it found me. It's ridiculous. And I love what I do. I love being with my patients. Um, it's rewarding, like you're helping people. It has its challenges when you're dealing with people that are struggling with pain. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't know. I would do it for free. Cliche. It's lame to say but I'll say it (laughs) but also like I love that you said that you fell into it because everything that I've done has not been a clear plan it's usually just a oh here's this opportunity that just presented itself shall I leap into that or not and it ends up working out really well typically I Um, I think that's the best way to find your path in life you know it can be scary because you know maybe you live in a van down by the river or (laughs) you know maybe end up a physiotherapist one day so it's tough to say yeah so I went to some physiotherapy and a concussion clinic after I had a car accident on the, um, I always get this mixed up. I'm going to start this over again. When you're leaving from here and you're going towards Victoria street, am I on the seven or the eight? The eight. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Right. Yeah. Do you know? Last time you were on the highway, you were in my car probably. Yeah. You don't um, highway. Marshall doesn't highway. No. No. Let's just, I'll just get start over again. Yeah. That sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went into some physiotherapy in a concussion clinic after a car accident that I had in, I want to say 2017, I was hit, uh, driving to work on the highway just before, uh, Wellington or Bruce street, actually on Victoria, everything came to a stop. Like it always comes to a stop there. And I had enough time to look in the rearview mirror and say, Oh my gosh, that car isn't stopping. I can, that car is going to hit me. Oh, here it comes, you know, <laughs> and hit. And I had a little concussion cause I did not, um, hit the front of the steering wheel, but actually my head hit the back or of my seat right so I kind of went forward and then hit back really hard um, but anyway the physiotherapy and everything that I had to go through for neck pain and all that kind of stuff was um, life-changing like I don't think I could have had that same recovery without having that service right right and I mean that's where the reward comes from um, but there are struggles you know there's days where you work with those concussion patients and weeks turn into months into years that they're just slowly recovering so managing that's a whole different perspective on physio but you know when you get someone better in a good time you feel great right and it seems to go in waves you seem to have the magic touch I guess you know you do do the same thing for everybody and you know specific to their needs and they all get better and you you do about the same thing six months later and nobody's getting better so um, those waves can be long and but you know you keep going through it and do what you do and it all works out some of those quote unquote games that we played for concussion therapy Mm -hmm. I was it was very telling for me because I had the wherewithal to be like I am losing this game. Uh, this game is not going very well for me, but it really showed me what was happening with my brain and how I couldn't connect the dots for some stuff that I wouldn't have assumed without these exercises that we were going through. For sure. And I think when you revisit those games and you beat them, yeah. it shows your progress, yeah. right? So an objective progress, which is pretty cool to see. Yeah. You know, when you're stuck in the in the chronic pain or dealing with it, you feel like I'm never getting out of this. I haven't made progress. But then all of a sudden you beat the game and you're like, yeah, I yeah. totally beat the game. So yeah. I'm in, I'm making progress. What is physiotherapy? Well, that's a good question, Marshall. Uh, yeah. What if somebody doesn't oh, know, right? Is I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, ex- question. I wouldn't be able, I, I just wouldn't be able to explain it to somebody. Right. Um, I have some idea that there's a, a room and a table, you know? Well, first off, we have to define type of physio. You okay. know, physiotherapists practice um, orthopedics, which is probably the largest group. And that's what we're most familiar with. There's a, uh, pediatrics, geriatrics, cardiorespiratory, and neurology. So, you know, whether it's a stroke patient on the neurology side or, you know, a broken wrist on the uh, orthopedic side. Um, And I'm on the orthopedic side. So what is it? You know, it's an assessment determining what's wrong with somebody, setting goals and looking for an improvement um, based on their goals and getting them back to their lifestyle, whether it was to the level that was pre-injury or even better than that if if the patient's looking for improvement. 
So my uh, super cool teenage daughter, Summer, joined the football team at Laurel Heights this year. Um, she was doing a great job and she fell and broke her hand and, lot, and missed the last like four games. Actually, just today she's going to, in podcast time, this won't make sense, but just today she's going to get a permanent, not permanent, that's what I'm looking for, proper cast at the fracture clinic. Um, anyway, what type of physiotherapy would she need? She broke, you know, I'm, I'm pointing at my hand here. I don't know what this is called. She broke this bone right here in the back of the hand. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, she'll just, to restore range of motion, mm-hmm. decrease any pain she has and inflammation, and also return her to full function and get her back on that football team, mm-hmm. you know, whether you like it or not. I know. Uh, <laughs> buying concussion insurance, it hurt a little bit. I was like, are we actually buying this? Is this happening? What is this bone called? Do you, do you know? She probably it. broke the scaphoid or the, okay. uh, you know, the metacarpals. What is kind of a more straightforward path to physio? Is it like a, somebody who studies a kinesiology or, or what, what are the many oh, ways yeah. that what was the path? people head towards that career? There are many ways to apply into the actual, because physio is a master's program for entry level. So getting into master's, I would say the great majority are kinesiologists as an undergrad degree, health sciences, bachelor of science. Um, I oddly enough have a very rare like biopsychology degree, um, but as long as you meet the requirements, you have the grade point. That's kind of the path. But for sure, kinesiology seems to be the major stepping stone and into physiotherapy. What's biopsychology? It's more like the psychology and how the brain works chemically with the body. Um, like pain it's cycles reactions. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, pain cycles, reactions. And oddly enough, I take this, and you know, you go to university, and that first day in your masters, you go around the table, you know, hey, I'm Greg, I went to Western for, and you, and everyone was kin, 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 and I was uh, psychology, kind of got their attention. Fast forward now, 15 years, we're doing a lot of, we're not doing psychology, but we're using it to understand maybe why our patients aren't getting better from a psychosocial aspect or why chronic pain's so effective, but, um, and how we can manage them, either working with colleagues of other allied health or working through it with the patient as well. Um, more on the understanding the neurology of chronic pain. I'm like terrified of prescription medicine. It's my own baggage I'm bringing to this podcast. I'm terrified of this stuff. And uh, after that car accident, my doctor wanted me to go on some pain meds and I just could not do it. And she was trying to explain to me the pain cycles and how I had to break this pain cycle in order to get to the other side and all that stuff that I don't really understand, but just the point is I didn't take it. And I think my recovery was probably longer because of that. Well, that's what she told me anyway. (laughs) I would say not necessarily. I think um, there's a good model on more accepting pain than getting rid of it and knowing what's good pain and what's bad pain. Um, You have a very good physician that took the time to explain those things to you. Um, Most, you know, write the script, go to physio, you're out the door, not taking the time to talk about um, pain cycles and the bigger picture of it. So the sooner the patient has the understanding of what is pain and, you know, sometimes we equate it to phantom limb pain. People understand that you're missing your arm, but you still have an itchy hand. Um, Same thing, even though the pain's gone from a fractured wrist like your daughter, if she's constantly thinking she has a fracture, it might turn into more of a cerebral type representation of the pain and she'll think she always has pain. So do you need medication to break that cycle? No, you just need good coaching. So I wouldn't. So you definitely need prescription medications. Thanks, Thanks for helping me release that here. And I didn't, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't have to carry that for the rest of my no, life. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> That's absolutely fascinating. It is, isn't it, Marshall? It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. I sometimes wonder for people who have chronic pain, um, why at some point the, um, I guess the body or the brain, something doesn't kick in and kind of resign to the idea that this is normal and that. I don't know. I, something things don't shut down, eh? Like I mean, the pain pe- pe- people's physical pain can just go on for a lifetime, and the body won't stop sending those signals to the brain or sending the message. You're in pain. Yeah, I mean, am I the expert to talk about this? Tough one, but you know, is the body still sending the signal that you have pain? No, the brain has a memory essentially of that pain, right? So you can do a a scan of the brain that will show the sensor for sensory of say your hand again. And it'll say, this person has pain, even though the testing and everything else says everything's fine. So it's more, it's up top, as we'll say. I have a, a neighbor who told me this story just a little while ago. He said uh, he'd seen surgeons for his back. He works a physical uh, factory job. And he was told he would have to have this, the only way out of this situation where he was basically bent over all the time with his back was 
uh, you're going to have this operation, and it's a complicated one. You're going to have two surgeons working on you at the same time on two different places, and this is what's going to get you better. And somebody suggested to him a physiotherapist, and he went, and he walked back into his doctor's office, standing up perfectly straight And they after time, right? And they said... It's not magic? It's not just like one visit? And oh, you- it's magic. No, <laughs> no, no the, the doctor said, so how is this possible? And I mean, how is it that you walked in here perfectly straight? And he said, uh, not only that, he goes, I rode my bike here. I'm feeling great, right? right? Yeah. Um, what, what, what happened? Like, what's happening there? Well, I'll be careful to say, I'd say not all physios are created equal. So, um, you know, he clearly came across somebody that took the time to talk to him, assess him thoroughly, come up with a good plan, see what his goals are. You know, it doesn't matter what my goals are as a physio, but, you know, what does he want to do and what are his expectations? Um, versus, I mean, in any profession, you get what you get, perhaps. So you can go to a place who sees someone who wants to pay a bill rather than get better. So mm-hmm. get him in, get him out. So clearly he went to somebody that took that time to put the energy and effort in because that won't happen at every clinic. And you as the patient, client, patient, 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 and you as the patient have to put the work in. You can't just. You do, but I would say that comes down to having a good coach. Right. And that's where physio comes in. Mm -hmm. And I think every new physio struggles with this. Yeah. Well, you have to reflect on your job in any case. So uh, any new physio would, I think we're quick to blame the patient for not being successful, but maybe I missed the mark on how I explained it to them. So. Um, sure, is it the psychology background or just being a people person? It's tough to say. So one thing that I do with my, I take students as well, is I have them look at the patient's occupation. And, you know, an engineer will want their diagnosis explained much different than an arts major, you know. And if you explain to the arts major the way you do the engineer, you're going to miss the mark. So you have to you have to be in a chameleon to your patient, I suppose, in how you explain it. Some want details, some just want to lay down and get better. So I think that theory applies like to life. You, you know, oh, totally. if you just apply your, here's how I explain things and this is how I'm going to bust through life, you know, you're not going to get too far or relate to too many people. But if you can shift and change and, and see things from other people's perspective, I mean, maybe I'm stating the obvious, that's where the success lies. I think that's it. I think it's funny you say it's the obvious, but sometimes you don't see the obvious till you self-reflect, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like, why is this not happening? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm approaching it wrong. It's probably the best bet. It's usually user error. User error, yeah. <laughs> For you as a physio, what is a, what is a moment of triumph? Like, is it, mm, is it somebody who has walked in uh, broken, for lack of a better term, and uh, after so many sessions or whatnot, um, is, is really walks out a new person or good to go? Yeah, I think, I mean, in the initial stages, you're happy with that. But I think the the problem is, is if you don't complete the whole treatment, they come back. You know, back pain is a great one. But if you spend that time and I, I, I have a saying, I think I say I can generally always fix people, you know, with, that's within my wheelhouse. But how do I make it not come back is the bigger picture. And that's why the assessments are so thorough. Like, how did it happen? If you play football and break your wrist, it's easy. Let's not do that again. Let's play football, but not break your wrist. Mm-hmm. Um but if you don't know where it came from, asking the right questions to figure it out. And it's like, well, maybe your chair is not set up right or maybe you don't have great lifting techniques. So addressing those things as as the problem and seeing them not come back is probably the best thing. I mean, they'll come back for something else, you know. Someone's bound to sprain a wrist or uh, twist an ankle. So This leads to my next question. What's the... Um, what is the level of people coming in for, you know, work at home related issues? Well, it's obviously advanced with the COVID work from home thing and people working from kitchen tables. Ta-da, uh, like, ta-da. like you see here, we're mm-hmm. in Studio K. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm not supposed to work. This is how I work, Greg. I'm hunched over like this, usually with like a snack and like an arm on a trackpad like this. Sorry, I'm going to talk into the mic. I'm usually hunched over with snacks, as Marshall knows. And I'm using this trackpad instead of the giant ergonomic pen tablet that I have. And um, by the end of the day, I'm hobbling away from the kitchen table. Yeah, exactly. So that's so, the right way to do it? Yes. Okay. For my business sake. No. <laughs> As a business model, set up. Um, and then we'll teach you to prevent that later. Uh, no, but that's exactly, I think we'll call that like a you know, repetitive, poor posture, postural stress, upper cross, they call it. Um, that's probably one of the more prevalent injuries 
through COVID and into now that, you know, eventually you're fine doing it for so long, but eventually your tissue gives up and it's like, you know what, I've had enough. I'm now sore. And I'd say those people are harder to fix and improve because it happens slowly and gradually. Now we have to reverse it versus somebody who sprained their ankle and is an active person. They actually get better a little quicker than the office worker will say. And it's habitual, right? So it's like, how do we break this kitchen table thing that Sarah does every day? Yeah, exactly. So that's why you look at the big picture. If I set you up for success and take away the tiny laptop and put you on a big screen, all those things help, right? Big picture stuff. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you too about the toll that sitting all day is taking on us, you know what I mean? Um, or, or just our bodies being in positions. I was telling Sarah a while back how sometimes I'm driving, my right hand's on the steering wheel, and my left hand is like clenched in a fist. And it's not like I'm necessarily <laughs> thinking negative thoughts or feeling overly stressed. I just, I'm, I go, oh my, why is my hand in a fist? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and just uh, our bodies are doing things without us realizing it, right? And that must take a huge toll on us. Or like I'm a big 10 and two driver. I don't know why. Maybe it's driver training or whatever. Driver's yeah. training from when I was young. Yeah. But the 10 and two arms are up there, but the shoulders are like, like all yeah. stressed up and I don't realize it until it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I mean, I, th- I kind of relate it to we're not supposed to sit as a species. Mm-hmm. You know, we're supposed to hunt, gather, climb trees, find water. That's what we're built to do. But we take that and we make it sit for 37 and a half hours a week at work or more. And then we come home, we watch Netflix. You know, maybe it's a very North American lifestyle thing. Life's too easy. So we sit too much and we pay for it. We're not supposed to. And then, but the problem is it doesn't happen instantly. It's a gradual insidious onset. Insidious. What a, what a, what a word to put on. I had to drop one in there. <laughs> also a great horror movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've never seen it and never will. Are you a fan of horror? No. No. Same nope. Things. Nope. No, thank you. All the bones stay in the body. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. And the blood and the guts. Um, so I think me and Marshall get some bonus points because when we have a meeting for Bond Park, we actually walk the neighborhood. There you go. Nice and slow. Take in the sunshine. Um, you know, breathe a little bit. For we just sure. did it this morning before we started working. Yeah. Yeah. And even it's, uh, I, I believe it, um, it changes the conversation we're having too. Mm-hmm, totally, the, the walking. You know what I mean? Like, uh, do you um, what uh, what role outside of your work does uh, does your own physical activity play? Uh, do you bike? Do you run? Are you? Oh yeah, you that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, in the summer, this is I'm where a, you lie. This is where I lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wake up ten push-ups every morning. And <laughs> um, I like golf. Golf's my thing. I enjoy the challenge of it. Um, the camaraderie of friends and the competition, um, physical stuff. I really enjoy playing squash. That's my go-to. Um, that takes a toll on the body, but I enjoy that quite a bit. Um, wow. Those are two really different really activities. Different, yeah. they are. The one, All with a little ball though. The one I've heard about golf, I, you can say this with any sport, but I mean, truly it's impossible to master golf, right? You can't, nobody can master. Well, that's what I tell my wife cause yeah. I gotta keep trying. Right. <laughs> And, and and squash to me is actually it looks like an incredibly intense like it just looks the, like a lot of fast running yeah and the second that ball leaves the, uh, the um you can tell racket, we've never played yeah, yeah. yeah. Marshall and I don't play like, the, 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 like I mean it, everything's like like incredibly intense right yeah. it is but I think the more you play the better you get it goes from a how do I hit the ball to now I'm going to place it somewhere. It becomes chess more than anything, right? The strategy of sport. So and it's incredible. You're in a, like basically a white room, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, like this where there's no other sensory things happening. Like the outside world is gone when you're playing squash, right? Yeah. And yeah. the intensity is good. And it's, you know, 40 minutes of intense activity and lots of stretching before and after folks. And then, uh, but yeah, those are my physical things and to being outdoors. I'm a big hiker, walker, uh, take care of the property, that type of stuff. So, what are your favorite uh, trails in town? Well, I live right on the Walter Bean Trail around oh, Rim Park, so I enjoy that one. Yeah. And I always forget the name. It's by the new um, transit building on Northfield. There it goes right to St. Jacobs. It's a great trail, and to others. Hey, when it comes to golf, um, I've I've heard about the n- number of surgeries someone like Tiger Woods has had from mm-hmm. playing golf. Mm-hmm. What is the body doing when it's playing golf that is taking such an incredible toll on a professional golfer? Like what, what parts of the body are being basically like kind of maxed out or worn down? Is it the liver? Is it the drinking that goes with golf? Maybe. Is that just some people? No. Well, I'll answer that later. <laughs> um, I mean, golf's such a spectrum, right? So it's the desire to hit it further, I think, is what drove people like that. Um, I think it's repetition. 
you know, someone like Tiger Woods, he's hitting four or 500 golf balls probably daily, you know, and that involves bending over, teeing it up, standing up, hitting the ball. It's that repetition that really causes the trauma. It's not necessarily the force. Um, but then golf's interesting because you can go out and I can get my butt beat by a 85 year old. Well, he's laughing at me the whole time. So, um, or is, is it even the, what's happening to the body when it's taking a swing? You know what I mean? Like it's, there's probably nothing else you do in life quite like when you hit a golf ball, right? Like it's, I'm talking about how the shoulders are aligned with the hips and everything that's happening. Yeah. It's a, there's a lot of moving parts in golf, right? And some of the new age golfers want to take those moving parts out just to have consistency, but the trauma to the body, I think it's more repetition, yeah. Marshall. Yeah. I think it's the repetitive over and over and over again and that drive to, to be better than the next and hit it further and all that stuff. But with like fi- my hunched over work style at the kitchen table. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Repetition. <laughs> with, with physio, what kind of dialogue is happening between yeah. you and your patient um, during a session? Like, is there like uh We've we've talked to, uh, for example, uh, people who work in uh, uh, like barbers and hairdressers and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. That's a very very social. Painters, oh, we're very so. We're, every artists. session is a podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We yeah. Uh, wait. You heard it here. There's a live well podcast in the making. That, we that, should. That, that that's also the isolated quote that we're pulling. Yeah, out, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> out of this. Uh, <laughs> Well, and they tell you in school, you know, they hint like, you know what, why don't you stay away from the big three, you know, politics, religion, et cetera. I feel like those are the ones we go to, you know, it's, and although it is nice to stop talking about COVID and go back to talking about the weather. Um, it is social, different than your barbers as we're legally bound not to share any information. So I would say patients do share a lot outside of, uh, their current reason they're there for. Because well, it's very intimate. It is very intimate. Right? Yep. And they're connected to you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's that trust that you have to create with the patient a lot of times because you're with them for a lot, right? Yeah. Do you think about like, um, you know, you get your uh, human, um, I guess, uh, fulfillment of human contact. People can live lives. Some people live lives for long periods of time without any human contact, right? Maybe even hugging somebody, right? These these are important things, right? It's massive. I think... uh, taking students again I talk a lot and remind them like just remember not everyone you know when you're in school you're hey lay down I'm gonna put my hand on your shoulder and we're gonna do this stuff right away versus there's consent and there's conversations and there's reading warnings there's reading (laughs) body language you know you can't just touch them without consent even if it's just as simple as a wrist or a foot you want to say hey this is what we're gonna do and um, but it does create that intimate connection where there's physical contact and you got to read the body language sometimes we don't do it on the first couple of visits until that person's comfortable I mean, you yeah. basically got to read it right. Um, and then, you know, it's spectrums and yeah. there's different cultures too. Yes. You got to be yeah. sensitive to, um, you might get the Eastern Europeans that are very comfortable with, you yeah. know, disrobing cause that's, that's healthcare mm-hmm. in parts of Europe versus other cultures where they won't even work with a male, which is totally fine. Yeah. So yeah. we, um, we're very cultural sensitive and maybe we have different rooms and different settings for those patients, but, um, yeah, you never know who walks through the door mm-hmm. or what they're going to need. What would be some of people's initial concerns if this is their first time? Is it kind of like, um, is this going to hurt? You know, like uh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I think we try to paint that picture when they sit down. The first thing I ask the patient, you know, obviously introduction, say, "Have you been to physio before?" And you know, I'd say most haven't. And then I say, "Well, this is how it's going to work today on the assessment day. We're going to talk. We'll do a physical exam. Then we'll talk about the diagnosis." So they see the. The play but then each one of those stages of the assessment you're further defining what you're going to do so again it is really about making that person feel comfortable and that's where it switches there you go from patient to person mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and am i right in saying this a physio is not like a seen a chiropractor from what I, I've never seen a chiropractor but from what i understand uh, that usually starts with x x-rays they need to take a look at what how things are aligned and what's going on with the body. Yeah, but physio is not about that, right? No, I, I think there's a lot of change from maybe old style, both physio and chiro. We've all identified what works with both research and just anecdotal trial and error, I suppose. But, you know, does every patient need an x-ray? No. You know, and, and chiros have identified that and they've gone more to that physical assessment. And, you know, sure, physios historically... We just did exercise and ultrasounds, but we realized, you know what, that's not the sole thing to get them better. We have to physically assess them as well. So there's actually a melding of chiros and physios 
um, just really doing what's best for the patient that's evidence-based and, you know, has worked historically. So yeah, there's a, there's a big evolution. You know, there used to be, I think in the States more than anything, a big headbutt between physios and chirals as they were stepping on each other's ground. But now they realize there's a place for everybody and they work together really, really well. When, uh, if I'm watching a, a television show and somebody has had a, a horrible accident and they have to, uh, and maybe the story is this person has to learn to walk again, right? Um, how is that achieved that somebody learns to walk again? Is it, is it as simple as, you know, the, the, let's say your legs feel like dead weight or feel um, like they're not doing what you had done your whole life and somehow the a physiotherapist is able to um, help those limbs along in such a way that like, I mean, talking like, like grains of sand through an hourglass, like little bits of improvement every single time that get you back to some kind of normalcy. Is that how that works? Yeah, I'd say it's a, you know, that's not my field. I'd say that's more of a neurophysio. A neurophysio, um, yeah. Probably like a lot of them work at Freeport around this area. Um, one of my friends just came through Guillain Barre syndrome. If you guys are familiar with no, that, but essentially that? that's like a where your kind of nervous system shuts down and you lose function from your fingertips and toes right through to your lungs, and then it generally reverts itself to a good percentage. That sounds scary. Um, it is very scary. And anyways, watching him recover, you know, has been very interesting to see. But again, it's. That's a good analogy. Marshall and that's is neuro? Oh sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it would be more the neural style physio where there's really helping them walk. Usually that would be from a spinal cord injury or something traumatic to the nervous system. Um, but seeing that process of them come back, it's different than orthopedics can be a little faster. A little so you have to see rewards in smaller increments than than we're looking for in a outpatient setting. I want to ask you about acupuncture. I, sure. I, I don't understand uh, what it is okay. and how it works. Yeah. It's, it is magic. It is. No, it's all, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> you first, can't just sell the secrets. <laughs> can't, can't. I'll say the first thing too is, um, you know, physiotherapists use acupuncture as what we call a modality. Um, it's not a primary treatment of, I would say, I want to speak for everybody, but there are two streams of acupuncture. There's traditional Chinese medicine, which we don't practice. And then there's neuromuscular, which would be more where the physiotherapists fit in. So for lack of better words, you know, if it hurts here, we needle there. Um, but TCM is so whole body. I refer quite often to TCM for acupuncture because that's not my field and it helps people in its own way. Um, they look at the body way different than our Western medicine does. Um, acupuncture itself, you know, the goal is increase blood flow, um, decrease muscle tone, help support the treatment, not a treatment alone. And what are the needles? Like what, what is actually happening? They are individual sterile needles. They are rounded and bullnosed rather than serrated like a, a hypodermic needle. And they're quite small in comparison to say a blood needle. Um, you can fit two or three into a blood needle that that small. So they're meant to slide in. And to be honest, I don't know what they do, Marshall. They're, uh, they look so nonchalant, but their effects are massive. You can get a very... Uh, massive blood flow response where you see the skin color change and you're like, I just put a, you know, 0.2 gauge needle in there. How is this happening? But that's the uh, amazing part of the nervous system of the body. Wow. Um, yeah. Sorry. Do you have another acupuncture question? No. Um, what do you have your doctorate in? In physiotherapy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so is it kind of like um, there's a, a certain specialization that you really like pinpoint focused on one thing towards the end, end of your education and your career that you like this is your area that you specialize in? Well, that's a good one. Yeah, I took my doctorate while practicing because it wasn't offered when I was in the program and then it, it came along. So it's professional doctor. It's not thesis based. It's project based. Um, I guess in that, yeah, I was really interested in that differential diagnosis. Um you know, like I said, a lot of people can fix people, but figuring out what the root cause is, is, is my, uh, it's my focus on my practice. Cause if you don't start there, then maybe you miss the mark and then they get better, but they come back. So then, Oh, I missed it. It was this. So, um, you know, and physiotherapists are considered primary care practitioners in that we can see people off the street and we're trained to identify if the injury is not say orthopedic, you know, um, for example, someone might represent with back pain. And you, you look at them, ask a few questions, and it turns out it's what's called a AAA, an abdomin, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, so we're trained to hopefully never miss that and make that referral quickly to the appropriate practitioners. Um, and that's what separates um, some practitioners from others where they're, they're there to be a primary care and make sure they, 
they identify that this is what I'm treating because this is what it is versus something that could be greater um, in that aspect. And are, in saying that, are you defining the term differential diagnosis? Is that what that is? Is um, Yeah, the, the, I mean, the you start. And, and making sure you've got the right diagnosis? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. You got to break it down. But you have to include everything. You know, you don't just say because you walk in, you have back pain, it's automatically orthopedic. You have to include everything until you determine it's not that. I'm going to backtrack. You're from Waterloo Region? Nope, Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. Yeah. Okay, what brought you here? My wife's a teacher, and at that time, there's no teaching jobs in Niagara Falls, and I still don't think there are. Um, So we moved here because of the growth in Waterloo at that time fueled by the tech slash BlackBerry industry. Lots of teaching jobs. Physios are fortunate at this point. To, there's lots of jobs around the province. So um, it was here with Sega Beach and because uh, it was also growing quite a bit right. back in uh, in 2006. When did it feel like home for you here? Ooh. I don't know. You still working on it? Yeah. <laughs> I always feel pretty transient, you know. Yeah. I think my parents moved quite a bit just within Niagara. So I didn't, I've never had a home that I'm like, attached like to that one family house no yeah. Yeah. um probably more my wife's family house because they've been in it since they were married mm-hmm. and that's the only place i've known for, we've been in, together one way or another for 25 years um so that's that's a home for sure but home yeah good one no answers for you guys there i do enjoy you know the nice part i think about this region is you're an hour and a half from everything you know, um, I like to ski and be outdoors. So I'm up at Blue Mountain, hour and a half. The beach is an hour and a half. Um, arts in Toronto is an hour and a half. And then families, you know, you can do a day trip back and forth to Niagara. So it's this little cool pocket. Um, really enjoy it. I would, we have our own cool stuff. We do. Yeah. yeah well, David, I mean, having seven in the square is pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. David yeah, Chilton, the wealthy barber, he, uh, he lives here. And he, um, he could live anywhere in the world that he wants to. And he said, you know, I can't, I've never seen anywhere else where you can be at the Perimeter Institute. And 10 minutes later, you're out in the farmer's fields yeah. in St. Jacob's. He's exactly. Like, you know. Hey, uh, as we start to wind down here, um, can you reflect on this career you've made for yourself? You know, like this This looks like a kind of a dream job to me, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, you, you go to work every day realizing you're doing something very, very important and you're helping people. And uh, but um, but a lot, a lot of work went into getting you here, right? For sure. Um, I don't know. I feel like sometimes my life's full of cliches, but I can't do what I can't do if I don't have my patients show up. You know, Not that I want them to get injured, but they actually make that effort to get in the car and drive to the clinic and take time out of their week. It's, it's not simple. Um, definitely the support team that is around me from the admins to my colleagues, you know, sometimes you just don't know. So you have to ask a colleague, you know, whether it's a co-physio or a chiropractor massage, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it just, it, it, when it comes organically and naturally, it seems pretty straightforward, I think. But yeah, pretty lucky. No complaints. Sarah and I are super excited for season four and all the amazing shows we're going to bring you. We're also really excited about our secret side podcast called an unscripted spectacle wrestling with wrestling and it's not actually about wrestling no it isn't (laughs) it's about a lot of things mostly life yeah and and there's a lot of laughter (laughs) yeah there's tons and tons of laughter we're incredibly proud of it so please check it out on all your streaming platforms an unscripted i can't say it can you say it an unscripted spectacle wrestling with wrestling Bond Park is made possible with the support of the Waterloo Region Community Foundation, the Kitchener Public Library, our local sponsors, and you, our loyal listeners. We make this show in Sarah's Kitchen. If you like it, please rate and subscribe. That helps us get the word out to more listeners. The Bond Park theme song is by Alan Lung.